Hello, and welcome to Good News Rhode Island, the show about Rhode Island and the people and places and events that make Rhode Island a great place to live, that build our community and bring interest to each one of us. Today we have a very fun show planned. We're going to be interviewing Professor Chef, which is a school for teaching of uh, cooking. And here we have Philip Griffin and Melinda Coletta, who are here with us. We are in their kitchen. They have been very hospitable and let us spread all over there downstairs with all of our stuff. So here we are uh, taping something that is normally done privately in your own home. And so we thank you for having us here. Um, we've not talked about cooking very much on Good News Rhode Island, so we're very happy that you're here. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Maybe we could start with you talking just a little bit about your training and what it takes to make a chef. And I think it probably takes a lot more than just learning how to break eggs or whatever. <laughs> I, I think it takes a strong desire. Um, I've always, I always wanted to be a baker. So at the age of 12, I wanted to be a baker, and I had uncles who were bakers. So I went to a vocational school. And when I went to the vocational school, I learned how to bake, but I also learned how to cook at the same time. So when I learned how to cook at the same time, I just found it was easier to get a job as a cook or a chef at a restaurant. And I've been doing it all my life, and I love doing it. It's just it's fun. And if you, you have to love doing it. I um, say to a lot of people, if they want to learn how to cook or they want to do it for a living, go work at a seasonal place for a summer. If you still want to cook after you work there, then go ahead and take it on as a job because you get put through the ringer. You really do. If you want to learn to cook, don't cook in Newport in the summer, I'm sure. It's yeah, true. exactly. <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you learn to cook and you have favorite recipes. And what is your favorite bakery recipe that you make, baking? Uh, baking? Oh, geez. It's my mood. It depends on my mood. It's the, today, today, maybe you say, you say baking and I think I'm thinking noodles. That's the first thing that came to my mind. Tomorrow could be something different. Yeah, it, Gee, it, it, how do we miss snickerdoodles? <laughs> <laughs> Melinda, you've been trained as well as a chef. It's very unusual to have a chef team. Actually, I'm just the cook. Um, I wanted to be a chef, and when I went to my parents when I was graduating high school and told them I wanted to go to Johnson & Wales, where he graduated from, um, I was told that it wasn't woman's work. And so I ended up majoring in food science and foods and nutrition um, and have worked my way into this. And then I taught him everything I know. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so most people think that the kitchen is not romantic. I happen to think that sometimes it is, because my husband and I uh, cook together. But what do you think? Is the kitchen a romantic place? Um, well, it's where he won my heart. Um, there's nothing sexier than a man who can cook him with those sparkling blue eyes <laughs> to kind of seal the deal. Um, but it's interesting because this is where we disagree a lot. Um, it's, it's wonderful that he cooks well, and I think I add to that. But um, I believe that there's 17 different kinds of salt, and he believes that there's only one. Yeah. Kosher salt. That's so, all I deal with. <laughs> so there are differences. There definitely are differences oh, definitely. in ways. Everyone cooks in their own way, has their own path that they've followed to learn how to cook, yeah. and maybe they need to verify some of that or assume some of that is true and then learn new things. Yeah. Is that right? Right. And one of the biggest things when we teach people how to cook, we actually bring back an old childhood saying, we teach you how to play with your food. We want people to play with their food and experiment and do different things. And when, when the two of us are going back and forth, we'll give you 10 different ways to go to the same accomplishment. As long as you're happy and you're eating fresh and natural ingredients, that makes a big difference. Okay, my mother told me never to play with my food, so this is a total <laughs> relearning. <laughs> I'm yeah. hearing her talking in my yeah. head. All right, well, what are we going to cook today? Um, today we're going to do something just, I, I think it's very basic, but you learn a lot of different techniques. We're going to teach you how to make crepes. Uh, okay. You know, Julia Child, we're gonna, we are going to we, we make a crepe Suzette, which is that classical fancy dessert. It just sounds fancy. It is so simple to make. I, I think that anything with a French name intimidates people and tastes better yes <laughs> tastes does. better yeah. okay so how do we start and i've learned from you as we were setting up here that you only use your own uh excuse me you only use fresh ingredients you don't buy anything pre-made correct so you you and we'll get to this later you make your own cheeses your own wines and you're also interested in making your own sauces so you make the sauce for the crepes at um etc so Let's begin then with 
Ooh, cooking. I hope you're making it, not me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the biggest problem that people have when they make crepes is they don't make their batter up ahead of time. So what we do is we make a batter up at least a half hour to an hour ahead of time. And then you don't want to over mix your batter. So that makes things a lot easier. So the recipe that we're giving you right now is a very standard basic crepe batter. It can be either sweet or savory. So Melinda, what she's going to do first thing is she's going to, she's going to crack her eggs and she's going to put it inside. Now if you notice, she's not cracking her eggs on the outside of the container. She's cracking on the hard surface because what happens is if you crack the egg on the outside of this surface, the salmonella has a chance to go up inside the egg. So we always help people to crack their egg on the flat surface. She's adding flour. So you're assuming there's salmonella on the edge of your... The salmonella is on the outside on the, of the egg, oh, not the on the inside of the, of the egg shell. Yeah. I see. A cup of flour, half a cup of water, three quarters of a cup of light cream. Very rarely do we use light cream. We love heavy cream, but in this batter, the light cream works. Um, then I'm going to put in three tablespoons of melted butter. And if you noticed, I put the eggs in first. And now I'm going to put the butter in separately because I don't want to make scrambled eggs. So if I put in, um, if I put in the um, butter, the butter that was hot, then we would have scrambled eggs. So we we let that cool down a little bit and keep it separate. And then a pinch of salt. That's a, and that's kosher salt, his favorite kind of salt. And then we're just going to process it. So here we go. Ten seconds. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight, nine, ten, you're done. That's it, folks. Now, so all we're going to do is put this in the refrigerator, let it auto lies. That's our new word for the day, auto -lization. And just what it Can means. Can you say that again? Auto lies. Auto -lization. And what it is, is the flour is getting a chance to absorb all of the liquid that we have put in there, but also we're going to give the batter a chance to rest in the refrigerator to get rid of all the bubbles. I use canola oil when I'm making my crepes. The reason why I use canola oil is it's, um, if I put butter in here, it's going to burn relatively quickly. So I use just a regular vegetable oil. It keeps me from burning the, uh, the butter on it. So uh, canola oil is actually better for you as well, is that right? It, it, well, they're both good for you. It's just a matter of you don't want to use a lot of everything. Mm -hmm. And if you use everything that's fresh and natural, it makes a big difference. So I put a little bit in. I'm going to make sure it's hot enough. Now this is a batter that we, we made earlier and that we let rest. I have a two ounce ladle. And if I get my pan hot enough, well, let me test it. It's hot enough. You just put a little bit in and if it bubbles, it means it's, it's hot enough. hot enough, yeah. Is that on eight, Melinda? Yes, it is. And then all I want to do is take and swirl it all around. The first one's always the tough one. It's like making regular pancakes. Now the secret to getting the crepe is you want to watch it. As you can see right here on these edges, this is dried out. What's going to happen is it's going to slowly dry out all the way across. Dry out looks like it has bubbles on it. Is well, it's, it's going to, the color will change. See the, the colors, darkness of the yes. color? So you notice we're pretty much close to being all done. The biggest problem people have whenever they're cooking is they want to touch it and they want to move it right away. Let it sit, let it cook. Now I just take my spatula, commit to it, flip it over. And that one's so-so. It should have been a little bit hotter because it's not as brown as it should be. The next one will be better. Yeah. The first one's always tough. And all we have to do is just take it right out. Okay. Okay, now the, uh, the oil is really diverse, diver diversified or right, so spread all pour, over the pan. Pour it in. And I'll, I'll, I'll add oil as I see fit. But I knew I had enough oil in that pan to begin with. And now you see how much th that spread out a little bit more evenly. The second <clears throat> one is always better, just like yeah. making regular pancakes. Also see how much quicker this is starting to go in um, and, and drying off. Yeah. And this is not in the, the fancy pan. This is just a regular stainless steel, regular stainless steel pan that you're needing to use. Um, sometimes they sell you the crepe pans. The crepe pans have a shallower edge. So you don't have to go in as deep as with a spatula. It looks looking good. See how it's all drying off here? Just got a little bit more to go. Now this batter we made here is, as I said, it's just a, it's a plain white batter. If you want to change it up a little bit, you want to be, make it healthier, 
we do what we call, we, we take out 50% of the white flour and put in 50% of a wheat flour. Is that a galette then? Is that a galette? No, no it's, it's just, 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 a, just a different version. Just of the, a different version. version and of. when we're making our crepes or crepes, um, depending on the filling, we'll decide whether we want to go with an all-purpose flour or white flour or a 50% whole wheat and 50% um, uh, the wheat, all-purpose The wheat flour, flour has a tendency to give it a more savory approach. It has a tendency to give it a little bit of a nuttier flavor to it. And how about sugar? Do you put in less sugar for the <clears throat> Well, we, the there's no sugar. The, savory? There's, there's, there's very little sugar. So the savory crepes, you can cut back on the sugar, and I can add herbs, dried herbs or fresh herbs to it. This particular batter that we made today, we can go either way with. We can do it as a sweet or a savory application. Um, there are batters that are just for sweet applications, and there are batters that are just for savory. This one will go either way because we only put salt in it. We didn't put any um, herbs or, or sugar in it. This is beautiful. All right, I do. It's I'm, so simple. I'm doing this one. You get to You're make. Next. The, you get to make the next one. Oh, <laughs> you'll be sorry. Okay, I'm going to try this. Confidence. Now swirl. How's it feel? It feels fine. I think because you have enough oil. Whoa, it's not really... It's good. It is? You yeah, remember, whenever we make it a crepe... It's a non-round one. <laughs> They're going to be rolled or folded. So people never see a round crepe like that. They're always done something to it. So you can have all sorts of sizes and shapes, and nobody's going to know the difference. And what we tell our students is, Gordon Ramsay doesn't work here, and he doesn't live in your kitchen at home, so it's OK. That gives a lot of permission, is that right? <laughs> yeah, we're giving everybody lots of permission. Now, how do I know when it's time to flip it? See the last bit right there, it's drying right out. Uh -huh. Just that little tint of color change. And you're perfect. Okay. Yeah. Commit to it, flip it. That's oh, beautiful. Great color. Awesome. Too bad we didn't have a live audience. They'd be, um, <laughs> they'd be, they'd be clapping. clapping. You think that? Yeah. <laughs> that's gorgeous. Yeah, and that's ready to come out. Okay. You also have a very nice spatula. I have to say, those plastic spatulas just don't work. Yeah, I, do I, I, I searched for a while, and that was a nice, flexible, and it's a fish spatula. You want to do one more? Fish. Yeah, yeah. the fish spatula. What do you know? Okay, you just put very little oil. Oh, very little oil, yep. Is that to trip me up? No, because that's all you need. The pan doesn't need a lot. It's, it's got a nice surface to it. The pan's already seasoned, so yeah. it's good. And <laughs> this is one of those things you can make up ahead of time. So if you're having a dinner party, you can make up all your crepes up ahead of time put them in the refrigerator, and then serve them, pull them out and serve them later on. But how do you put them? Do you stack uh, wax paper? You can put wax paper on them. If you're going to use them right away, it's not that bad, bad of a deal. But if you're going to use them within six hours or so, I put some thin wax paper in between. Um, if they're going to be sweet, you can actually put a little bit of sugar. It helps keep them uh -huh. sticking too. Uh, you're talking about granulated sugar. Granulated sugar, yes. Yeah. Another beautiful one. Yeah. Well, this one's uh, a little elliptical. Like I said, Gordon Ramsay doesn't work here. <laughs> oh, I really like that spatula. Though. Beautiful. All Excellent. Right. <laughs> so you would use these for a meal of meat or a meal of fish or? Anything. We, we have, when we do crepes, when we teach people crepes, we do an appetizer crepe. So we start out and we think of the crepe as something like a, um, an egg roll or a, a flour tortilla or anything that you can stuff with things. So we, we put a, that type of a filling in it. Um, then we can go to an Italian style where we can take and put it and fill it with ricotta cheese. And we and make them manicotti or manicotti. manicotti. <laughs> then if I want to put meat in it, I can put a meat in it. What I do is a lot of times I make what they call a mousse. So I puree chicken or seafood and I pipe it in the center of it. And because it's made with egg and cream, it helps hold it together and roll it up so you have a nice mousse with it. And they cook it afterwards? You cook it afterwards. So the manicotti and the, and the, the mousse filling go in the oven and cooked. And then I can have those all laid out in a, um, a pan, and I can have them done up ahead of time. And the last one would be my dessert crepe. And the dessert crepe um, is actually you make up the sauce. You really never really ever, um, roll the sauce in it. You actually fold it in thirds or quarters, and you, you dredge it in the sauce and serve it. 
And our favorite, wow. our favorite dessert, we're going to make you guys crepe Suzette today, but our favorite one is banana and Nutella. <laughs> I've heard that. I've heard that. In fact, I've seen it for sale in, in restaurants. The, the kids love that one. So. so, Phil, we have to fill these now. I'm not meaning to make a pun. Um, but uh, most people think of crepes as being something for dessert, and you're talking to us about crepe for something as an appetizer. So maybe you should just start. Go ahead. Um, yeah, we're going to make an appetizer crepe. Um, tonight we're going to season it up with like basic Asian type of, of, of flavor. So we're going to make like almost like a mock egg roll. Um, I'm using fresh vegetables. So I have um, in the bowl here, I have julienne of onion, carrot, celery, red pepper, and then I have um, mushrooms. I did a julienne cut because it's nice and thin and they should all cook relatively quickly and fast. Now, do you use a uh, special gadget for that, or did you use a knife to make I this? I use my knife and hands. Just a knife, yeah. okay. You, if you have a special gadget, use it. It makes things a lot easier. Um, we have a very hot pan right here. We were cooking at 800 for the crepes, we're now up to 1800. That's wattage, so it's extremely hot. What I'm gonna do now is gonna mix a little bit of canola oil, so that's a one count. Sorry, this is just way too hot. And a little bit of olive oil. Put that in my pan. It's interesting that you just take the pan off when it's too hot. Um, and I just put in some of my way. vegetables. Okay. But it's, it's a good way to keep things regulated. It's just to pick up Are the you, pan right. rather than worrying about it. Yeah, it's natural instincts sometimes kick in. And what I do is I have my vegetables all in the pan here. I want to let them cook a little bit without moving them right now. You, you can't smell it on the TV, but I can smell my vegetables. I can hear them popping, but I'm getting the, side, the smell of a sweetness to it. So that means everything's going to start caramelizing. You're going to get some flavors developed out of that. That's the biggest problem, again, people have is, oh, I want to turn around and I want to start touching these right away. Let it cook. Let it, let it do its thing. If you notice, we've got a really big pan and not a lot of vegetables in it. It's actually sautéing. It's actually cooking really well. So now each what piece of vegetable has its own bottom of the pan. Right. So now what I'm doing is I'm going to just let, let, lightly flip them over. As you can see, some of the onions are already browned up right there. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little bit of... I'm going to throw my garlic in now. And I'm throwing the garlic in now because I don't want to burn it. That's why I threw the garlic in a little later. Um, some I did people say they put garlic in the microwave first and then put it in because it's less... Flavorful. I personally like the flavor of yeah. garlic very much. And I like it. And, I'm, and if you notice too, I'm using sliced garlic. I'm not using diced. So it gives me a chance to get a more uniform cook on it. Um, when I cooked, I did one pot canola, two pot olive oil. Canola is for the heat. Olive oil is for the flavor. Okay. That's so, very helpful. Right. So now my vegetables are starting to soften up. The mushrooms are going in now. Because mushrooms contain 80% moisture. So if I put my mushrooms in now, they're not going to um, put a lot of moisture back into it, and they're going to get almost what they call a dry roast with the mushrooms. Gives me a better flavor. Okay. What and you use? want a dry roast rather than something that's too moist Moisture, because right. the, the flavor's diluted. Right. And I'm going to use fresh ginger. So, so this is a microplaner, so I'm just going to grate in some fresh ginger. And we don't even peel the ginger. And it's going to collect on the bottom, and he's going to scrape oh, it I off Oh, I see. The it's bottom. not going to come off. Yeah. I see. And where do you buy fresh ginger? Um, oh, every market. Every market. Okay, so yeah. you just ask at the vegetable area yeah. where the fresh ginger is. And I just mix that all in together. Now, we're sautéing. Sautéing, you're cooking with high heat. And you've got to be very careful when you're sautéing. You don't want to burn your whatever you're cooking, even though we're using vegetables. So when you want to put out a fire, what do you do? You know you throw on some sort of a liquid. Liquid is a way of cooking, putting out a fire. So to stop this from burning, what I'm going to do is I want to deglaze my pan with a little bit of sherry. Okay, deglaze means? Deglaze means to pick up all the little bits and pieces that are on the bottom of the pan. So if you notice right here, see all that brownness right there? Mm -hmm. That's what I want to pick up on the bottom of my pan. So if I turn around and put just a little bit of sherry in, it's going to splash. Now, if you look at the bottom of the pan, it's pretty much cleaned up the bottom of the pan. Okay. I have a little bit of soy sauce. And that's it. that's it. We'll fill it. Put some dust down the center. And then we just roll with it. There we go. 
course, Chef Bill would probably put a little bit of a garnish on there, some vegetables on the outside just to let you know what, let you're you know what you were eating on the inside. But the plate always needs to look nice, is that right? Yes. Well, you it eat, tastes better. You eat with your eyes first, your nose second, and your mouth last. Very interesting. To make crepe Suzette, what we have done is we turn around and we made a, a butter, almost like it was a compound butter. So in here we have... There's sugar, orange peel, orange juice, just a little bit of butter. There's a lot of butter in there. <laughs> and maybe, just maybe, some booze called triple sec. Yeah. Um, I'm a little frugal, so we're using triple sec. Um, if well, you want Quantreau, to get Quantreau, Quantreau or Grand Manier, uh -huh. you really want to go the uh, nine yards. So I put that in the bottom of the pan. Now, do you want to tell us the full ingredients? How much butter is there? Four and a half ounces of butter, uh, a half a cup of orange juice, a half a cup of regular sugar, two orange peels. Um, two peels of two oranges. Uh, no, two peels oh, on one orange. Okay. Okay, so just it's two. A potato peeler. A potato peeler. Um, and three tablespoons of the triple sec or, or um, Grand Marnier. Um, and this is actually Julia Child's recipe for crepe Suzette. And, the, and all you're doing is you're making a, a basic caramel sauce. So, so caramel sauce is sugar and butter. And, you got, and when you're dealing with caramel, I'm sure you're not to scare the home person, but you've got to be careful. Sugar is very, gets to be very, very hot. So you, have to, you ha do have to be careful with that. So my sauce is pretty much done. Now, if it was, and you know it's done because it's because all of the bubbling? Bubbling and the consistency of it. So now what I do is take the crepe, put it in the pan. Oh, my. Okay. That's very different from what I've seen. Flip it over. Ah. And just fold it in quarters. Let me do one more. And what you think is, gee, that dinner was good, but this looks delicious. <laughs> <laughs> you want to start out with a nice dinner, you want to end with a nice dinner. So I understand that we got here at 11 o'clock, but you had already been cooking for a long time or working for a long time, making duck prosciutto and sausage and cheeses, and most of us were just brushing our teeth. Mm -hmm. So I'm pretty impressed. So down in your basement, you have one special room for curing, essentially. Correct. That's correct. Yep. This time of year, we can hang um, our meats because the temperature is down low enough to be about 60 degrees, 55 to 60 degrees, so we can, we can dry all our sausages and our meats. Um, the cheese, we're actually cheating a little bit. Whenever we do cheese, we um, have a wine cooler that we throw our cheese in. So I have about 250 bottles of wine downstairs, but none of it in the wine cooler. The wine cooler is meant for the cheese, because cheese has to be kept at 50 degrees. So now we have, so the red cheese right there is a cheddar cheese. That's going to go in the refrigerator for six months to a year, and we're going to be able to eat that. So the cheese making process is a lot of time involved. The wine making process is a lot of time, but I can do a lot of volume at once, whereas cheese, I only can do one or two pounds, whereas wine I did... 200 gallons this year. And how many pounds of grapes did you buy? A ton and a half. We, we break it out for special occasions, um, and we break it out when we have to, we're teaching winemaking classes. Uh, we'll, we'll break it out for that for them, to, for, for them to sample as well. Now you have other really wonderful things here. Uh, let's start with the duck prosciutto, because we have several different uh, yeah. stages of making that. Duck prosciutto, out of all your dry curing, is the easiest to do. All you simply have to do is go to the store and buy a boneless duck breast. Well, I don't do that, but that's another story. Because uh, <laughs> it's just too expensive to buy a boneless duck breast. I buy a whole duck. So what you do is you take, this bo boneless, you take the boneless duck and you turn around and you give it a little bit of score on the top where the fat is. And then what you do is you take the duck and you place it down in the salt, cover it with salt, and then you leave it in the refrigerator for about 12, no, 24 to 36 hours. And I think it's very important, too, that this is kosher salt that is not iodized table salt. So it's a coarse salt without the iodine in it. Okay. So that, that's the first step. After that's been done and the, the duck is going to get a little firmer too because the salt is going to pull out moisture, you rinse it off, pat it dry, and then we wrap it in a cheesecloth 
so the cheesecloth is there to let it breathe, and we hang it down in the basement. And we tie it and hang it. So this, this is left to dry for approximately one week. Um, one week to two weeks. You need, it needs to be a little bit firmness to it. This has only been um, one, two days? One day. One, one a day, and you can see how soft this is, right? So. Okay. And then that's the finished product. And this is very stiff. Is that very, right? very stiff. Yep. Okay. And it's got a beautiful layer of fat on it. Flat, mm -hmm. Fat equals flavor. Um, and we just love making that. And people enjoy it. Mm -hmm. um, then our next um, thing here is, this is sauce on sec, am I correct? Correct. Okay. Um, so this is a pork sausage that we just grind. And we add very little to this. Um, what we add to this is just some fresh garlic, salt, pepper, some pink salt, which is very important. The pink salt keeps the color um, as well as preserves it. Um, and then this is ricotta salata. Uh, we make our own homemade ricotta. And then what we do is we put it in this little mold, press it down, um, and let it dry out for about 24 hours. Once it can hold its shape, we turn it over, take it out. Once again, coat it with this wonderful kosher salt. And I mean coat it. We want to cake it in there um, and let that dry in the fridge for about seven days uncovered. Um, and then we just um, cryovac it, slice it, and eat it. When you say ricotta, what do you mean? It's milk, obviously, or it's whey? Well, there's, there's two types of, there's different ways of making ricotta. The most simplest way of making ricotta is to take milk, heat it up to 180 degrees, and then to a half gallon of milk, you add two ounces of cider vinegar. So that's just plain, ordinary ricotta. And I use that to make all my raviolis and my fillings, et cetera, et cetera. When we make a fresh cheese, or, or we make a cheese like that, where we have um, a curd, which we're using rennet, the cheddar cheese and the mozzarella, we have a leftover ingredient called whey. What happens with the whey is you can turn around and reheat that back up to 180 degrees, put some acid in it, and you'll have a ricotta cheese. We sort of cheat a little bit, and we add extra milk to it. So I'm adding a half gallon of milk to that. I put the vinegar in that and I strain it off. So now I have what they call, I have another ricotta cheese, but I call it whey ricotta cheese because um, the milk has picked up a little bit of those lactose sugars. So it's a little bit sweeter. It's a little, got, it's got a little finer curd. So it's just, it's a more refined ricotta cheese. Um, and we use both to make this. Yeah, we put mix both in and, and, and make the ricotta salata. So, and then with ricotta, you can add uh, chives or anything you want to make a flavor. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. For, yeah. for pasta. Pasta, right. And if we're doing dry cheese, we always, we always tell people to use dry herbs. You use a green or fresh herb, it leaches through. Because remember, when you're making cheese, you want to pull moisture out of the cheese. So you're putting fresh herbs in there, you're actually putting moisture back in, which you don't want to do. Wow. Well, we've got our work cut out for us, the crew and I. We've got to go home and cook now. <laughs> Um, I wonder if we can have some tastings. Sure. Absolutely. Red or white. I'll try the white. Thank you. We've really enjoyed being in your kitchen. Merci beaucoup. Grazie. Thank you. And chin chin, salut, and cheers. 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 Here's to you. And thank you for watching Good News Rhode Island, the show about Rhode Island, and all of you who make it a great place to live. We're sure good news is right around the corner, and you're going to help to make it, maybe in your own kitchen. Thanks for watching.